Hey, folks. <laughs> I just weaseled my way into this thing and, and to get an opportunity to introduce to you our next speaker. Now, our next speaker is the heroic man with the encyclopedic brain. And, of course, we all know who that is. Scott Horton. Now, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not nearly done. Hold on a minute. Scott Horton is one of the only people in this movement who makes me feel like a lazy bum, okay? I don't know how many thousands of interviews this guy has done over the years. He is the host of Anti-War Radio on KPFK 90.7 in Los Angeles. He's the editorial director of antiwar.com. He's the director of the Libertarian Institute. He hosts the Scott Horton Show. And he is the author, most recently, of Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. Before he had the Scott Horton Show, he had the Weekend Interview Show. He's tired of me telling this story. But this was like in the early 2000s, he had the weekend interview show, and he would interview some interesting libertarian every weekend, and it was never me. Uh, every friend I had in the libertarian world had been on the, the weekend interview show, and I'm thinking, what is with this friggin' Scott Horton? What do I have to do to get on this guy's show? And now he's like, you know, we, now I've been on the Scott Horton show a bunch of times, but he's like one of the favorite guests on my show. And he's also a favorite guest for me, because all I have to do is ask him a question, then I can go downstairs, make a sandwich, you know, mow the lawn, come on back up there. But this guy is one of the hardest working people in the movement. He knows everything there is to know. But whatever the foreign policy subject is, I immediately think, I wonder what Scott Horton's take on it is. And even if there's some big complicated thing I just that I'll never understand, I feel comforted knowing that if I needed to understand it, Scott could explain it to me. So ladies and gentlemen, a big, big cheer for the hero himself, Scott Horton. All right. Mike, check. Wow, hi, everybody. Thanks very much. That's pretty kind of you. Come all the way here from far away. It took me a while. I got here. All right. Um, so, sorry to bring your buzz down after that great introduction, but I'm the bearer of bad news. That's my job. And uh, we got wars to talk about. And I know that this is obviously... A friendly crowd of like-minded folk and none of y'all really are into American exceptionalism and imperialism but then again you probably still might want to hear what I have to say about the last few or yes yeah, so decades of American Middle Eastern policy and how we got in the mess we're in and why it really is time to just quit it so long before George W. Bush ruined the 21st century Jimmy Carter was ruining what was left of the 20th. And our story begins, of course, with the Iranian Revolution in 1979, but that, of course, means really back in 53, when Ike Eisenhower and Alan Dulles and the CIA overthrew the democratically elected government and the Prime Minister Mossadegh in Iran, in, for oil reasons mostly, Cold War reasons too. And they reinstalled the Shah Reza Pahlavi as the dictator. And he ruled that country for 26 years with American support, uh, including his murderous secret police, the Savak, who were trained by the Americans and the Israelis in all the fine arts of torture, etc. And then, but in 1979, the Shah was dying of cancer, and he didn't really have a natural successor, and the regime was falling apart. And a popular revolution broke out, and the, the Shah fled the country, and it was a massive popular revolution, and... It's funny, this is really not secret, and yet it goes almost always unremarked upon, even from some oldsters who were adults at the time and ought to remember this. I remember, uh, even as a kid, wondering, as I saw footage of the Ayatollah Khomeini getting on the plane in Paris, France, to go home to Iran. And I remember even as a kid thinking, well, 
aren't the French our buddies? And why would they send this evil old Ayatollah home to Iran to inherit the revolution if the Americans didn't want that to happen? Well, the answer is, of course, they wouldn't do that. The Americans did want that to happen. The CIA and the State Department had advised Jimmy Carter that, hey, the Ayatollah Khomeini, we know him. He's an old friend of ours from 1953 when his group helped to agitate against Mossadegh and helped soften him up for the coup. We know him. We can work with him. And so that was why the French let him get on the plane to go home and inherit the revolution. And another thing that always goes unremarked upon, which again couldn't possibly be secret, it's a matter of the calendar and long-term memories for people who were alive back then at least, if not in the popular retellings on TV, that before the great Satan and the burning American flags and the hostage crisis, the revolution was 10 months earlier, in February of 2000, I mean, 2000, of 1979, was when the Ayatollah had inherited the power. The Carter administration tried to work with him and did work with him and his government all through the year 79. The hostage crisis didn't break out until November. In the meantime, in fact, Carter had been passing the Ayatollah's regime intelligence about threats from the Soviets and from Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Saddam Hussein, who had just taken power in a coup against his predecessor and leader um, in that same year. And so what happened in November, though, was that David Rockefeller convinced Jimmy Carter to let the Shah into the United States for cancer treatment. And that was taken as a symbol in Iran, or a signal, that the Americans were going to try to reinstall him in power and cancel the revolution in another coup. And so that was what caused the riot and the seizing of the hostages. Now, Americans understandably have hard feelings about burning American flags and American diplomats and spies being held hostage. And it's not to justify what happened, but it's just to tell the whole story, that there was a massive provocation and a real reason for them to think that they were defending themselves by doing so. In fact, the last coup had been plotted in the embassy back in 53. In fact, this is where they coined the term, the CIA coined the term blowback, meaning the long-term consequences of secret foreign policies. So that when the consequences come due, the American people don't understand the real reasons for them. And instead, radical Islam, fundamentalist Shiism, or Iranian nationalism, or just irrationality ends up taking the rap instead. Now, the same year, 1979, in July, Jimmy Carter signed a finding, that's an authorization to the CIA, for them to send money and weapons to the Afghan Mujahideen holy warriors who were fighting against the Soviet-backed communist uh, dictatorship in Kabul. Now, the avowed reason for doing this was to provoke a Soviet invasion, which might sound confusing. Wasn't the policy in the Cold War containment of the USSR? Yes, but then, after Vietnam, the American people had what our government considered a mental illness, Vietnam syndrome, a reluctance to get their other son killed in another one of these stupid wars, proxy wars around the world, fighting against the Reds. And so they said, well, listen, we have this dilemma then. If the American people have Vietnam syndrome, maybe instead of containing communism, we'll bait them into overexpansion. Not into West Germany, but hey, how about into Afghanistan? and then we'll give them their own Vietnam. Since it was so destructive to us, we'll do it to them. And that was their words, Walter Slocum and Robert Gates and Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1979. We we're going to give the Soviets their own Vietnam in Afghanistan. And that was the reason that they started funding the Mujahideen. Now, that's not really the reason the Soviets invaded. Soviets invaded that Christmas and they did so because their own sock puppet dictator was doing a horrible job of being one and his regime was falling apart. And so as soon as they invaded, the KGB took him out back and shot him and replaced him with a new guy. However, point still stands. That was why the Americans were intervening there, is they were trying to lure the Soviet Union into a no-win quagmire to help break their bank. Now, as soon as the Soviets did invade Afghanistan, the Carter government panicked and said, oh no, look, if they roll into Iran next, weakened Iran, revolutionary Iran, which had, you know, had just undergone this massive transformation, if the Soviets roll into there, they'll dominate the Persian Gulf and global oil supplies, 
And then from there, they could go around the mountains and seize the port of Karachi from Pakistan and have this massive new expansion of Soviet power. So in reaction to the invasion of Afghanistan that they had deliberately provoked themselves, they then decided they had to double down and announce a brand new policy, which Carter announced in January of 1980 in his State of the Union address, the Carter Doctrine, where he announced that the entire Persian Gulf is now an American lake. And any attempt by any other government, read the USSR, to dominate the Persian Gulf will be treated as an attack on the United States, uh, just the same way that they had threatened if the Soviets roll into Western Germany, we will treat that as an attack on the United States, that level of commitment and threat. And as part of that Carter Doctrine, they started building up bases in Saudi, in Qatar, and in Bahrain, and they encouraged Saddam Hussein to invade Iran to try to overthrow the Ayatollah. Saddam Hussein had his own problems in Iraq. He is a Sunni sitting on, at the time, sitting on a minority Sunni tribal dictatorship now, the Ba'athist government did include Christians and Shia and others, even Kurds, I guess, but it was dominated by the Sunni tribes. And they were ruling over a 60% Shiite supermajority. That's in all the land from Baghdad to Iran and down to Kuwait. It was all predominantly Shiite territory. Now, Saddam was worried and had good reason to worry that many of these Shiites oppressed under his dictatorship would choose their religious sect in the Iranian fundamentalist revolution over their ethnic Arab and national Iraqi sect, and that they would side with Iran in the new Iranian revolution and would bring it into Iraq. And so in order to preempt that crisis, Saddam Hussein conscripted them all and sent them to invade Iran instead and thought it would be quick and easy, and of course it was not. It led to a horrible World War I-style trench warfare uh, type of a war that lasted all through the 1980s and ultimately killed approximately half a million people on each side, they reckon. Now, uh, when Reagan came into power, he picked up both of these policies right where Carter had left off. And first of all, not only did he back the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, but his government also worked with the Saudis and the Pakistanis to support the new Arab Afghan army which was made up of volunteers from all around the Arab world and in fact the entire Muslim world as far as Chechnya, the Philippines, and the USA. And you guys have all seen Rambo 3 about it. <laughs> and as Colonel Trotman said in the movie, the purpose of this is to give them their own Vietnam. We've already had our Vietnam, now you're going to have yours, he says to his KGB captor in the movie. Now, um, so this was tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 men went in and out of Afghanistan uh, to train in the camps and to fight against the Reds. And for many of them, it came to no consequence, but at the same time, as everyone here knows, as virtually everybody knows, I think, this is where Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri and their core group that became Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the Azam group and eventually Al-Qaeda, this is where they earned their stripes, fighting against the Reds. Bin Laden was wounded three times in battle. And so that was part of the reason why people respected him. Here was a rich boy who slept on the dirt floor with his men and had actually paid the price in combat. So uh, now the thing of that is, of course, that at the end of the war, the Reaganites will tell you, and Hillary Clinton will say too, that, and I think this must be true, right, that the Soviet Union's defeat in Afghanistan really helped to destroy the Soviet Union. It was one of the straws that broke the camel's back. They couldn't afford it. And all the dissension that it created back home, the trap worked. And as Zalmay Khalilzad wrote in the Washington Post, it worked better than they thought it was going to. They just wanted to give the Soviets a hard time. They didn't think they'd lose the war, much less watch the entire empire fall apart in the direct aftermath of the thing. I mean, this, the troops actually withdrew in 1989 in the middle between the wall coming down and the final end of the USSR there. And so the Reaganites took credit for that, and the Americans took credit for that, John Rambo took credit for that, but so did, so did Osama bin Laden and, and his whole group. And look what we can do if we only fight faithfully. We can bring down the communist, atheist, you know, godless Soviet Union that they hated just as much as the Americans did. 
And so they learned an important lesson from that, uh, one that the Americans chose not to. Reagan also continued to support Iraq against Iran and including the use of chemical weapons, which were purchased with American tax money from the Germans and the French and then used by the Iraqis against the Iranians, including with satellite intelligence that the Reaganites had provided them. And this included the use of sarin and Taben nerve gas and the worst chemical warfare since World War I. And then they had a problem at the end of the war, is that oil was trading for only $10 a barrel and Saddam Hussein was broke. And all of the Gulf states that had loaned him money to fight the war, he thought on their behalf, and truly uh, to a great degree on their behalf, started calling in their loans, and particularly the Kuwaitis. And I've learned, given this speech recently, that I don't have time to talk all about Iraq War I. I've got to skip it. But suffice it to say, and it's in the book, I don't think they deliberately did so. But in effect, they entrapped their own asset, Saddam Hussein, into invading Kuwait. And they basically gave him permission to take the northern oil fields. And once he went too far, they decided to exploit it. They refused to negotiate. And then they launched this horrible war. Now, they said it was quick and easy and painless and only took, the ground war only lasted 100 days, no problem. But that was 30 years ago, and we've been bombing Iraq ever since. And that's not rounding up. That was 30 years ago, in 1991. And we've been bombing them ever since. Now, what happened was, what was not so tidy about the end of the war was the Bush senior government, which they had taken up from the Reaganites, it was basically the Reagan third term, the same men. Uh, they had encouraged the Shiite supermajority of southern and eastern Iraq to rise up and overthrow Saddam Hussein. They dropped leaflets over their army divisions, and Bush senior himself gave a message over Voice of America Radio encouraging them to do so. And the Americans dominated the entire south of the country at the time, in the aftermath of Iraq War I, and were occupying it. And yet, they changed their mind. And they let Saddam Hussein keep his helicopters and enough tanks to crush the insurrection by the Shiites and also the Kurds in the north. More than 100,000 people were slaughtered in this massive Bay of Pigs type betrayal. Well, why would they do something like that? Well, remember Saddam Hussein invaded because he was worried that the Iraqis were going to take the side of the Iranian revolution and try to import it into Iraq? Well, that's exactly what they were doing. They weren't just moving on Baghdad to overthrow Saddam Hussein. They were being led by the Iraqis who had chosen Iran's side in the Iran-Iraq war. They were coming across the border to lead the insurrection. So the Bush government, which was made up of James Baker and Colin Powell and all of the same men who had been responsible for the 1980s policy of backing Saddam Hussein to contain the Iranian revolution, choked and said, oh no, what are we doing? And so they changed their mind and they left him high and dry and let him be slaughtered. Well, but then that became the excuse to stay. I'm going somewhere with this. That became the excuse to stay. Well, the insurrection was over. Saddam Hussein had crushed it. It's not like he was going to murder every last woman and child in Shia Stan. Uh, it was over. But it became the excuse for America to launch what they called the no-fly zones and leave their bases in Saudi Arabia in order to enforce the, the long-term blockade, which they never lifted the sanctions from before the war. They kept the sanctions all through the 1990s. They kept on the pretended snipe hunt for weapons of mass destruction, even though they had all been destroyed by the end of 1991, and the UN inspectors, led by Americans, knew for a fact that that was true by 1995. And they continued to you know, put on the pretension that they were looking for banned weapons as they kept on the blockade and the sanctions. And then this became the primary reason that Osama bin Laden and his group of Mujahideen, who had worked for the Carter and Reagan-backed effort in Afghanistan in the 1980s, to turn against the United States of America. And they said so explicitly from the very beginning. Bin Laden was kicked out of Saudi Arabia for denouncing the king, for allowing the infidel forces, not just on their home territory, but their holy land, the holy peninsula land of Mecca and Medina. And not just Americans, white Christians, but combat forces. 
And not just combat forces standing around, but combat forces who were bombing Iraq on a regular basis from those bases, which was taken to be intolerable. And what we now call Al-Qaeda, which is essentially a merger of the old Azam group with Egyptian Islamic Jihad, started attacking the United States in 1990. The first one they killed, first person they killed in America was a radical American rabbi named Rabbi Kahane, who advocated the complete cleansing of the West Bank and Gaza Strip of Palestinians into Jordan. And uh, they assassinated him in New York City in 1990. The same group then were the ones who blew up the World Trade Center in 1993. In fact, there was a failed attack in 1992 in Yemen. I always skip that. But I got to say about World Trade Center 93, because it is important, the CIA had intervened with the State Department who wanted to keep these guys out and said, no, go ahead, let them in. We know these guys. They're friends of ours. We backed them in the effort in Afghanistan. And so they were living in New York, a whole cell of what you would consider real al-Qaeda terrorists, led by the blind sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. At that time, it was just Egyptian Islamic Jihad, but this is the group that grew into al-Qaeda. And then when they had their plot, and they came up with their plot to bomb the World Trade Center, they recruited an Egyptian army intelligence officer who went straight to the FBI and said, I've been recruited by real no fool and terrorists to build a bomb and bring down these towers. You gotta help me stop them. And they had a plan, and it was an absolute proven fact, you can read all about it in the New York Times and everywhere else, that they had a plan to switch out the explosives with an inert powder and bust these guys. And the FBI supervisor basically called the whole thing off and botched the whole project. And the informant then split, because he thought he was burned, and they brought in Ramsey Youssef, who built the bomb that they set off in the basement that killed six people, but almost succeeded. And all the engineers and experts agreed about this. If they'd only parked the truck over there instead of here, it would have brought down one tower and knocked it over into the other, which is what they were trying to do. At 4 or 5, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they could have killed 20, 30,000 people in an instant. And luckily they failed, but done, it was a major failure of imagination to play down that threat after six people died when it could have been so many more. And it goes to show you about the quality of our security forces for allowing that to happen under their nose when they had a walk-in informant from the very beginning to stop it. And when those guys shouldn't have even been allowed in the country anyway. Um, okay, so then they attacked us all through the 1990s. They killed Americans training National Guardsmen and that's not our kind of National Guardsmen, that means the secret police in Saudi Arabia. And then in 1996, do you guys remember the Kobar Towers attack in Saudi Arabia in 1996? That one made some headlines. 19 American airmen, airmen were killed. And you know what they did? The Saudis and Bill Clinton and Louis Free at the FBI, they blamed it on Iran. They said it was Iranian-backed Saudi Shiite Hezbollah that did the attack. And why did they do it? Nobody knows. They had no motive at all. It was just a target of opportunity from across the way. And they obviously didn't believe it because they didn't bomb Tehran over it. They didn't do anything over it. But they let bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the actual perpetrators, get away with it. And they deprived the American people of a very important lesson that there are these Saudi radicals who are incensed that, and very specifically chose that target to show us how incensed they are that we are bombing Iraq for you know years on end here. At this time, it had been seven years already. We've been bombing Iraq from bases in Saudi. And instead of getting that message, the Americans got this muddled mess about the Ayatollah that went nowhere and then the story was dropped. The next year, no, two years later, 98, they bombed Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya, the American embassies there, killing hundreds. And then there was a failed attempt on an American destroyer and then eventually the successful attack on the USS Cole in port in Aden, in uh, Aden, Yemen in 2000. And in fact, there was just a story that came out about the horrible Judith Miller at the New York Times who lied us into war with Iraq. She came out and said she had a story from the summer of 2001 where 9-11 hijackers or, or Al-Qaeda guys who were aware of the plot were saying, yeah, it's really unfortunate that the bombing of the coal did not lure the Americans into attacking, but the next one will. And then that was what happened a year later was September 11th. And the American people, it's understandable and forgivable. They knew very little of this history. 
And no one on TV wanted to remind them, even of Rambo 3 or of any of the backstory from this at all that they might be able to clue into. And frankly, right there on TV, right in the image, is just like in the cliche, the planes come out of the clear blue sky. So tell me what's going on. So the government had the American people basically just wide open to fill their brains with whatever nonsense they wanted, which was they hate us because we're standing here being innocent and free and white and Christian and loving our mama, and they can't stand that. And the more you love your mom, the more we're going to have to go to war over there to defend <laughs> reason and decency and caring from the irrational, implacable, religiously inspired, psychopathic enemy that has no reason that you're allowed to read, you can read it at theguardian.com, but it won't be in the New York Times, Bin Laden's letter to America, explaining exactly what the hell is going on around here. And that was, of course, warning us. You can either get out this short way and the, and the easy way, or you can fall for our trap right there in plain language. You can come and we'll bog you down and bleed you to bankruptcy the same way we did to the Soviets, and then you'll leave the hard way eventually. And that was the plan all along. They said so all along. And I quote in both books, Omar bin Laden, one of Osama bin Laden's sons, did an interview with Rolling Stone magazine in 2010 when bin Laden was still alive. And he says, you know, in Clinton's time, he shot some cruise missiles at my father and he didn't get him. But you guys have been occupying Afghanistan for 10 years and you still haven't gotten them. Better you would have saved all those hundreds of billions of dollars for your economy. In Clinton's time, America was smart, not like a bull that goes after the red scarf. And then he elaborates. In 2000, when Bush was elected, my father was so happy. This is the kind of American he needs. One who will attack and invade and break the country meaning America on the rocks of Afghanistan. And he said the same thing over and over again in, in my first book, I quote every source I can, saying the same thing all through the 90s and after September 11th too. In 04, Bin Laden said, all I have to do is send a scarf upon which is written Al-Qaeda to the furthest point east and you'll send all your generals and all your billions of dollars racing and there's nothing in it for the American people except for the corrupt, connected corporations who do this all, and the generals who do all of this at your expense. And that is why we continue this process of bleeding you to bankruptcy, he said. And that was the real motive behind September 11th. Now, I got to tell you, if you guys are unfortunate enough to read the New York Times as often as I have to, uh, Brett Stevens wrote a piece just three, four weeks ago, I guess, on the controversy of ultimately leaving Afghanistan, which is still not completely decided. Uh, but he cited bin Laden's taunts that America's a paper tiger. All I have to do is set off a truck bomb here or there and the Americans will turn tail and run like a bunch of cowards. And here Brett Stevens, 21 years into this briar patch mess, sand trap disaster, says, see, we can't leave. He says we're wimps. That's why we have to stay forever and ever and ever. And of course, because Brett Stevens is a wimp, and so he's pretty easy to taunt, and it works. And that's all it is, is a taunt. That was what September 11th was meant to represent. They didn't think we were going to turn tail and run after that. You think bin Laden didn't know about the American Air Force? He didn't think we were coming. He wanted us to come. In fact, here's a story I like. I'm taking too long, but I don't care. You guys like it. So John Miller, John Miller was an ABC News reporter who interviewed bin Laden in 1998 in Afghanistan. And he later told a reporter, another reporter in a discussion that uh, when he met bin Laden, he talked all this grandiose stuff. Yeah, me and my few dozen friends here, we're declaring war against the United States of America. And John Miller just thought this was absolutely absurd. And he told his friend that he thought at the time, yeah, you and what army, pal? But that's the answer, is the American army. They were jerking our chain. They were getting the Americans to do what they wanted to do. And it wasn't just they wanted us to invade Afghanistan and bankrupt the American empire and go home the long and the hard way. They wanted us to overthrow as many governments in the region as we could. They wanted to take over Saudi Arabia and Egypt primarily. 
but overthrowing the socialist infidel Saddam Hussein, as Osama bin Laden called him. The former chief of the CIA's bin Laden unit said that was the hoped for but unexpected gift to bin Laden. If Afghanistan was all they ever wanted, then Iraq was just absolutely carrying Osama bin Laden's water. And if that much, well, I don't want to skip that. Well, we'll go on from there in a second. Let's stick with Iraq War II for a second here. Now, the reason America went into Iraq, Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld had their reasons, but the strategy behind it came from the neoconservatives, namely David Wormser and Richard Pearl and Douglas Fife, and along with Paul Wolfowitz and the others, Scooter Libby and Hadley and the rest. But their plan was written in 1996. It's called A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm. And it was written not for the Americans, but for Benjamin Netanyahu, then the incoming Prime Minister of Israel for the first time. And what they thought was, to break it down, it's complicated and it doesn't make sense, but that's because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> they said, listen, the problem is Iran backs Hezbollah in southern Lebanon by way of Syria, okay? And we have to break that to protect Israel. And so to do that, we want to focus on removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq. What? But he's the Sunni roadblock on that whole so-called problem of the Americans and the Israelis here with Hezbollah. So why would they do that? Well, their harebrained scheme was that if they got rid of uh, Saddam Hussein, that that would give the Jordanians and therefore the Israelis and the Turks and the Americans dominance in Iraq. The Iraqi Shiites, well, they just love bending over and taking orders from anybody who claims to be the descendant of the prophet Muhammad. We're assured that by our friend Ahmed Chalabi, the Iraqi exile. Well, that was just nonsense. The Shiites do revere a certain line of Muhammad's descendants, but not the Hashemites, who are Sunnis and entirely alien and irrelevant. And in fact, when the British had installed a sock puppet Hashemite king in the 1920s, like they have in Jordan still, the Shiites were under a fatwa that they were refused permission to associate with the king or cooperate with the government in any way, which helped lead to their downfall. They had no reverence whatsoever for the Hashemites. This was some harebrained nonsense that they had been fed and that they believed. And that was why they did it. But then that's not what happened in the war. And everybody knows that Iraq War II was bad. I met some veterans on the way here today. I know there are a lot of veterans here today. Everybody, in fact, many of whom still don't know the answers to these questions, fought right in the thing, but are so zoomed in they don't know who's who when they zoom out. What happened in the war? What was so bad about it? What was so bad about it was that George W. Bush had picked up right where his father had left off in 1991 and helped that Shiite supermajority come to power in Baghdad and, in fact, fought a five-year civil war on their behalf using our Army and Marine Corps to cleanse Baghdad of Sunni Arabs and make it essentially an 85 to 90 percent Shiite city and turn over the government. They can call it a democracy because it's a supermajority Shiite state. And so the, not the people, but the political factions on the Shiite side are the ones who inherited the power. But it took a massive civil war with America on the majority side to accomplish that. And of course, as a major consequence of that, that meant they were pushing the Sunnis right into the arms of the bin Ladenites. There had never been a suicide bombing in Iraq ever. There were no bin Ladenites in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. He'd have put them right up against the wall if they dared to pop their head up. But now in the chaos of the war and America taking the Shiite side, that ended up increasing support as the saying went at the time, that they essentially turned Western Iraq into bin Laden University. There were thousands of jihadists and the entire society was radicalized in terms of politics and religion. And the same thing happened all across the Middle East, the destabilization of all of America's sock puppet dictators and all of their economies and their politics and religion and everything else. And it also became a magnet, just like Afghanistan in the 80s, where jihadist fighters came from Syria and Libya and Saudi Arabia and around, and that's our friends, the Saudis, supplying fighters to fight against the Americans who were fighting on the Shiite side in that one. 
And then, are you still with me? Is this fun? Okay. I'm just making sure, because it, it's a big mess. But so, so that was the heart of the war, okay? America took the side of the guys that, that Saddam was afraid of in 1980, the reason why he started the war against Iran, the guys that Bush had encouraged to take over the government, Bush Sr., had encouraged to rise up in 91 and then betrayed. Bush Jr. came and brought them all the way to power. And then, as I was saying, as a result, pushed the, uh, the uh, Sunni insurgency into the arms of bin Ladenite-type religious radicals and really political Leninist types, uh, revolutionary types. So, and that ended up you know, increasing bin Ladenite-type terrorism all around the world by thousands of percents compared to before September 11th or before the invasion of Iraq. Um, and now, um, okay, so that brings us then to 2005, end of 2005, beginning of 2006. Many of you may have read this. You've heard me talk about it on the show if you listen to the show. I bring it up all the time. I really think this is kind of the key to understanding America's Middle East policy in the post-Iraq War II era, and that is the redirection by Seymour Hersh in the New Yorker magazine from 2007. And the policy was about a year old at that point before it really got into print about what exactly is going on here. And what was going on here was that Zalmay Khalilzad and Elliot Abrams, two very powerful neoconservative thinkers in the government, they fessed up to what I just explained to you. We really screwed this up. We put the Shiite supermajority in power in Baghdad, but they don't need us. They're the supermajority and they're friends with the Iranians next door. And in fact, it was Iran's favorite parties, Dawa and Skiri, who were leading the coalition government in Baghdad. And so we might have all this money and all these guns, but they really don't need it anymore. Once the civil war was won, they have their alliance with the Iranians next door, and so we're useless to them and we can go. And so we really botched this, and everybody's really mad at us, particularly the king of Saudi Arabia. And it's in the WikiLeaks, uh, thanks to Chelsea Manning and to Julian Assange, which I saw Manning throw Assange under the bus yesterday and that really pissed me off. But anyway, Assange is in solitary confinement right now for this. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, it's in the WikiLeaks that Khalilzad went to meet with the Saudi king. And the Saudi king says, I don't understand this. It was always us and you and Saddam Hussein against Iran. Now you have handed Iraq to Iran on a golden platter. We only have silver platters, but they're fancy types over there, you know. <laughs> the, the very few ruling elite are. Um, and so they, it, you gave Iraq to Iran on a golden platter. Now what are you going to do about it? And Khalil Zad says, we're at your service, your majesty. And so this is now the entire key to understanding American policy not just since W. Bush, but since about halfway through W. Bush, or two-thirds of the way through W. Bush. The change didn't come with Obama. It came, the change came under W. Bush. We really screwed up. We scored a huge one for our regional adversaries, the Iranian Shiite Alliance, and so now we've got to make it up to our Sunni kings in Arabia. And then the first thing they did was go on to Libya. Now, if Afghanistan was all they ever wanted, and Libya and, and Iraq War II was the hoped for but unexpected gift to bin Laden, then Libya and Syria and then Yemen, this is far beyond Al-Qaeda's wildest dreams, okay? Now, it's true that we have not put bin Laden himself on the throne in Saudi Arabia, but as we'll talk about in a minute, we did put essentially his clone in power in western Iraq for three years straight in the form of the caliphate. And... Uh, we had not put Ayman al-Zawahiri on the throne in Egypt, but then again, he's still alive and still podcasting and recruiting people to threaten the United States, and his people benefited greatly from America's policy in Egypt during the Arab Spring when they supported and then betrayed the revolution there. But we'll skip Libya. You know it's a disaster, uh, but it wasn't really part of this anti-Shiite effort. The Saudis just hated Gaddafi for other reasons, and so... Um, the most important part for our narrative here about Libya and for time's sake is that they took the jihadis who were, uh, I guess I should mention this part at least, that the Libyans who went to Iraq to fight in Iraq War II against the United States 
when they came home to Libya, Obama took their side. And this is right at the time that Obama is killing Osama in Pakistan. In the spring of 2011, he's taken bin Laden's side. It's the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, Ansar al-Sharia, and al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, as they call it. And these guys were veterans of Iraq War II, where they fought under Zarqawi on the suicide bomber side against the Americans and the Shiites. And here they came home to Libya, and they said, oh, no, this is a humanitarian effort to save the people and all of this, and took the side of these guys and caused a civil war that's been going on ever since. And then they took all the guns and all the jihadis, and they shipped them off to fight in Syria. And that's the core of the real Benghazi scandal. Everybody knows that these guys were essentially left far out in a fort without enough force protection out there. But the real scandal was what they were doing there in the first place. They were working with the Qataris to run terrorists and guns off to the next war in Syria. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who were the worst of the Sunni insurgency in Iraq War II, the suicide bomber, head chopper maniacs, when they came across the border into Syria, they became the moderate rebels. And this was because America, again, when they fought Iraq War II, for the Shiite side, that was because they were stupid. They thought the clean break was going to work for the Sunni side. This was a huge, as they say in soccer, an own goal, right? A huge mistake for their adversary. But what's the status quo? The status quo is, since Jimmy Carter, America and the Saudis worked together to back bin Ladenite terrorist suicide bombers against their enemies. If we stopped doing that after September 11th, and after Iraq War II, or during Iraq War II for a little while, then that's the exception. Instead, it's right back to business. And we know from April of 2011, from one and a half months into the Arab Spring, okay, well, two and a half months, that John Hanna, Dick Cheney's man from the vice president's office in the W. Bush years, wrote a piece in foreign policy, said Prince Bandar bin Sultan is sending Saudi jihadists off to fight the war in Syria. And from that point on, that's all you needed to know, that this war is treason. And you can't even call it a covert action. There's nothing covert about it. We all knew it. And it was uh, Alistair Crook in The Observer, our friend Eric Margulies writing it at ericmargulies.com and at lourockwell.com wrote about it. And um, we know now from the Stratford leaks and, uh, I'm sorry, two or three other sources from 2011, uh, they knew that uh, these are the worst guys from the last war who were coming across the border into Syria, but... Oh, well, it's worth it. And Hillary Clinton, in February of 2012, it was just three days after her meeting with the Syrian National Council, who were supposed to be able to take over and create a new government. And she expresses no enthusiasm for them whatsoever. She just met with the puppets in waiting. In fact, their group had been groomed by Liz Cheney, the current representative from Wyoming, Dick Cheney's daughter when she worked in the State Department. And Hillary Clinton met with them, and they're just a bunch of embezzlers and scumbags and screwballs, and they weren't going to be able to do anything. And she's on CBS News, and the reporter asks, why aren't we doing more to get rid of Assad? And she says, well, Al-Qaeda. I'm an al-Zawahiri. Just supported, endorsed the revolution in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? And then she said, when it comes to finding a group of people that we could try to put in power to replace the current regime, some responsible parties, we don't see that. Now, we know from the record that she continued to push for that policy that whole year long. She was defending Obama's reluctance to be even worse than he already was. Now, if you asked Hillary Clinton, she would say, we were trying to back the terrorists. We were trying to back the moderates to marginalize the terrorists. Yes, the terrorists agreed that we needed to overthrow Assad, but we just wanted to build an army of nice guys to do all the fighting and inherit the power. But as Obama himself said, and was obvious all along, that was a pure fantasy. It was al-Qaeda in Syria, Jabhat al-Nusra, now Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, that led that entire revolution. They were the dominant force on the field the entire time. And if Assad's regime had fallen, it would have either been al-Qaeda or eventually their breakoff group ISIS that would have inherited the power. There was no one else to stand in their way other than the Assad regime. And, but what happened, though, was bin Laden had been killed in a decapitation strike, and Ayman al-Zawahiri, the new leader of al-Qaeda, didn't command as much respect. 
and so the leader of the Iraqi-dominated faction of al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, decided to break away from al-Qaeda's authority and to break away from Syria and al-Qaeda. He didn't want to keep fighting and get rid of the Americans the long and the hard way first. He wanted his caliphate now. And I guess it was reasonable enough since the Americans were backing their effort the whole time, he might have thought he was safe and the old rules didn't apply, right? And in fact, they didn't. And ISIS seized essentially the entire eastern half of Syria in the spring of 2013, ruled it with an iron terrorist fist, as you might expect that they would. And then one year later, in fact, six months later, they hoisted the black flag over Fallujah. And six months after that, in June, they rolled right into Mosul, and then they took Samara, Tikrit, Baji, and Fallujah was, became officially uh, a part of the caliphate, and they entirely, essentially seized all of predominantly Sunni western Iraq which had been left wide open for the taking by the new chauvinist Shiite government that the Americans had put in power there. And then Baghdadi, who might as well have been Zarqawi or bin Laden himself, got up there on the balcony like Mussolini at the Grand Mosque in Mosul and declared that he was now to be referred to as the Caliph Ibrahim of the new Islamic Caliphate. Now, if you're old enough to remember, I know some of you are too young, but if you're old enough to remember this era... Uh, or the previous era before that, the last war before that, during W. Bush, they would say that there's this Islamo-fascist caliphate that's coming for us. That was Glenn Beck's shtick. Remember that? The Islamic, the Islamo-fascist caliphate. Well, where the hell is it? There's nothing but nation states everywhere. There's no caliphate. Was he? There's no caliph. What's he talking about? But George Bush's war in Iraq and Barack Obama's war in Syria created the absolute impossible. Bin Laden's wildest dream come true. And just a couple of years after he died, three years after his death. And they seized a state the size of Great Britain. And then, of course, you guys know the rest of the story, right? 2014, Obama had to launch Iraq War III, again taking the side of the Shiites that they wished they hadn't fought Iraq War II for, the same guys that they had built the caliphate to spite in the first place, Now that it had conquered all of Western Iraq and embarrassed the hell out of everybody with Bin Laden's clone up there declaring himself Ibrahim and all of this, they had to launch the war for the Iranian-backed Shiite government that they wished they hadn't fought Iraq War II for. And that's why we still have troops in Western Iraq and in Eastern Syria now. If you look through the merest window dressing where they talk about fighting what's left of ISIS, which has been completely obliterated since the end of 2017, you'll hear them occasionally if you read it in foreign affairs or foreign policy or you know, where they talk amongst themselves, the, the policy mandarins. They're really there for Iran. They're there because everything that they've done this whole century long They weren't even trying to spite Osama bin Laden. They were trying to spite the Iranians who hadn't attacked us, whose Hezbollah friends had not had anything to do with the attack on this country. And yet everything they've done this whole time has only benefited Iran, which were friends with the Syrians, but now the Syrians are wholly dependent on them, or not wholly, but in large measure dependent on them for security and money and food and the rest. And America continues to keep Syria under what they call crippling sanctions in order to punish the civilian population for not going along with this project in large enough measure to get rid of this dictator, which again only would have empowered the bin Ladenites instead. As as again, uh, uh, President Obama himself said, the idea that there was an army of doctors and lawyers and teachers and pharmacists of moderates who could take on al-Qaeda and ISIS and Jaysh al-Islam and Arar al-Sham on one side and Hezbollah and Iran and the Syrian Arab army and eventually the Russians on the other? Come on. It's ridiculous. It was never going to happen, and they knew it. They kept this policy up anyway. And so then, how much time do I have? Not any? Oh, that's a lot. Here, I'm going to have a drink. So now, you guys know that if Iran was making nukes, they'd have had some by now. So they must not be making some. So we're not going <laughs> to, they're really not. So we're not going to do the whole litany. But that's the, that's the back story for this next little section is about the war in Yemen. And it starts with Obama's nuclear deal 
with Iran in 2015. Now, we didn't need a nuclear deal with Iran because we already had a nuclear deal with Iran. It's called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Iran is obligated to have an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency to safeguard and verify all of their nuclear material and make sure that none of it is diverted to any military purpose and the IAEA has always done so. Everything you ever heard in your life, top of the hour news while you're driving around, Iran and the nuclear threat, all of it a lie, all of it just based on mythology. They have a civilian nuclear program. They're enriching uranium up to electricity grade, no higher. You can't set off a nuke with that and frankly, the Ayatollah strategy this whole century long has been my hands are up and everybody knows it and my books are wide open and everybody knows it so you can't shoot. That's been the policy, is not to provoke us. They have built up a big enough civilian program to try to trade away and that's what they did because they were already under crippling sanctions. And Obama put them under more and more and more sanctions. So then they built up their nuclear program more and more and more until they had something big enough to trade away. And that's what they did. So the nuclear deal of 2015, all it did was extra double verify Iran's nuclear program far beyond any other in history and just make sure that they couldn't possibly be making nukes. And they poured concrete into their heavy water reactor and expanded inspections and all of these things. Now, again, it was a fake threat of war or a fake threat for a war, but there was a real danger that we could get into a war at least over the height of tensions over the nuclear program and all the hype about the threat that it supposedly represented, mostly emanating out of Israel and out of their amen corner in the United States. So Obama said, look, we're just gonna take the threat of war off the table by double extra locking down the program over there and then that way no one will be able to really pretend that they're afraid that they're making nukes because it'll just be so beyond proven that they're not, the issue will die. That actually worked. Until Trump got us out of the deal, the narrative that, oh my God, they're making nukes, really was dead. And the deal did kill it. And it was useful for that. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I said on Tom Wood's show, I support this deal, all other things being equal, because I don't know what the Saudis are going to do. Well, the Saudis launched a war of genocide in Yemen. And Obama told them they could do it. And Obama helped them do it. And it was all over this. Saudi was mad that America signed the nuclear deal with Iran. Well, if they were really worried about a nuclear weapons threat from Iran, you'd think they'd be pretty happy about the deal. But they weren't worried about the nuclear weapons threat from Iran. There wasn't one that was all a hoax, as we just discussed. What they were worried about was that America was now going to tilt back toward Iran and that Saudi was going to lose their place in the American-dominated order in the Middle East. And hey, we did just fight Iraq War II for them. And so the Saudis said, you owe us one for that, and now you owe us another one. And the Obama government told them, fine, go ahead. And they told the New York Times, we knew the war would be long, bloody, and indecisive. But we had to do it to placate the Saudis because they were mad about the nuclear deal. Those are the quotes. Long, bloody, and indecisive. In other words, a lot of innocent people are going to die for a very long time, and we couldn't even tell you what victory is supposed to look like. But we have to do it, quote, to placate the Saudis. And that's it. And then so what that, meant, that has meant is that America, which has already supplied about three-quarters of the Saudi Air Force and all the rest of their weapons to the British make up the rest with their typhoons, uh, but they fly mostly American F-15 Eagles. And that has meant this whole time, American resupply of their bombs, all American contractors to do all the care and feeding of their planes, which of course the princelings never do themselves. And all the intelligence and all the logistics for carrying out the entire war, picking the targets and getting the planes in the air and back again and everything else. And for the first few years, um, it has meant uh, it did mean refueling, uh, mid-air refueling for the Saudi and UAE jets bombing the people of Yemen. And this is all because a group of Shiites came to power in Sana'a. And I'll skip the backstory there, but essentially you're familiar with, uh, as I mentioned, the bombing of the USS Cole, and I'm sure you remember from the last decade the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula attacks on the Charlie Hebdo magazine in France, and the Eagles of Death Metal concert 
and I forget if that was the same one as the Nice France massacre, but a few of those, and they tried to blow up the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009 with the underpants bomb, a real Al-Qaeda terrorist. And Obama had a war against them since 2009. I'll skip the politics for brevity's sake, but at the time that the Houthi group, the Shiites, had come out of the north, who are friends with Iran, but not their cat's paws, not their puppets, uh, at the time that they took over the capital city, the Americans didn't have a problem with it. They just kind of didn't have a dog in that hunt. And in fact, our current Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was then a four-star general leading Central Command. And the Wall Street Journal and Al Monitor both had in-depth reports in January of 2015 about how America was passing intelligence to the new Houthi regime that they could use to target and kill Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, America's enemies there. I'm not endorsing that part of it, but at least the fire is being directed toward those who have shed innocent American blood, uh, even as it's shedding more innocent blood there. But then just two months later, Barack Obama made this deal and turned around and stabbed the Houthis in the back and took Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula's side against them. And that's who America's been fighting this war for. Saudi, UAE, and with some you know, help from their friends, some mercenaries from Sudan and other neighboring countries, but essentially Saudi and UAE and Al-Qaeda, which has been more or less folded into the UAE's militia on the ground, fighting against the Houthis there. And I know it's CNN, but it's good journalism. You can read all about it, where they have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula guys driving around in American MRAPs, armored personnel carriers, and not just driving around in them for fun, but taking them to battle. And they didn't loot them from an American abandoned base like in Western Iraq or like in what's happening in Afghanistan as we speak. They were given these armored personnel carriers by the UAE. And these are the direct associates of those who bombed the coal and uh, did the rest of the attacks. Again, the, the Christmas Day attack of 2009. And so the war is treason. The war is outright, just like in Libya and just like in Syria, is they're directly fighting on the side of the bin Ladenites. But it's worse than that because the Americans have this policy. They, they started this in Libya, but they use it now in um, Yemen too. They call it leading from behind. And this policy, of course, continued all the way through Donald Trump without stopping. You know, it only accelerated in many cases. You know, leading from behind is sort of like a lynching. It's nobody's fault. We kind of all murder them a little bit, but none of us get lynched for, as punishment for it because the responsibility is diffused. And so in this case, the American world empire pretends that this is the Saudi-led coalition. And yes, we are assisting them. But if something's gone wrong over there, that's their fault, not ours, even though America's the world empire and they are our client state. But their policy with American aid and abetting this entire time has been to target, deliberately target, the civilian infrastructure of the country from the ground up, everything. The water, the sewage, the electricity, uh, the farms. And there's a great study by Martha Mundy from the London School of Economics who talks about how when they target the farms, they bomb the grain silos, they kill the flocks of sheep in the field, they bomb all the irrigation ditches, they uh, kill the horses in their stables. And they bomb, of course, the fishermen and their boats. And they, they bomb the, uh, any trucks or any infrastructure that can be used for delivering fuel or food to people. They target and destroy all of it. The potato chip factory. And not only that, but also funerals and weddings and all of these things quite deliberately uh, targeting the civilian population of the country. And this has included the worst cholera outbreaks in recorded history. And you know what that means? That means worse than what the United Nations did to Haiti. And that means worse than what George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton inflicted on the people of Iraq in the 1990s. These are the worst cholera outbreaks dating back to before the Second World War, when anyone was counting. Thousands of people have died, and that, of course, means babies. Toddlers and babies are the ones who die, but they vomit and defecate themselves to death. And in fact, Interesting thing about cholera, you don't even need antibiotics. It's a, it's a bacteria. You, you don't even need antibiotics, you just need clean water, but they don't have any because we bombed it. And this has been going on for more than six years now, and the last time the UN put out a count was two and a half years ago, and they estimated that it was 
250,000 dead. Well, they said 230 at the time. Okay, but it is certainly more than half a million innocent civilians have been killed in this thing. And look, a million died in Iraq War II. Most of that was the Civil War between the Sunnis and the Shiites that America, of course, was very complicit in. And, and another half a million were killed in Syria, and that was, again, absolute war crimes. Obama and his government backing suicide bomber, head chopper, murderer, terrorist. But in those wars, we didn't deliberately target the civilian population of the country with the purpose to reduce them to death the way we have done in Yemen. And I guarantee you, after covering this war for six years, that by the time we're done counting, it's going to be more than a million innocent Yemenis have died in this war that most people don't know the first thing about, uh, much less are doing any, anything about. Although I shouldn't sell them short because, in fact, they're really heroic activists in this country, led by Yemeni Americans, but also led by the Quakers, the Friends Committee, and all different lobbying groups in D.C. There is no Yemeni business lobby in America. There's no Yemeni oil lobby. There's no power connected to Yemen in the United States to represent them. They're not friends with the Israelis like the Turks are and can get a little extra leg up that way. There's nobody to speak for them except for regular people. And this war is such an outrage that you know, thousands of Americans, tens of thousands of Americans really have worked hard to make this an issue in the Congress. And despite anyone's belief, if you wouldn't heard of the thing, you might not believe me, that the House and the Senate literally invoked the War Powers Resolution of 1973 to, to try to force Donald Trump to end the war in 2019. And of course, he just vetoed it, and the war continues on. If he, he was to be impeached, it should have been for that. Um, Not holding up an arms deal to Ukraine. What the hell? You can, you can impeach somebody for that? Okay. So listen, let me just wrap up here. I'm not going to go on. I wanted to do that part fast and do this part long, but that ain't going to happen now. I'll say this. I think that there's a real opportunity for the libertarian movement right now. They said the libertarian movement came and, or moment, I guess as they called it, came and went with Ron Paul. And let's face it, Rand didn't exactly pick up the cudgel. And, and, you know, speak for us on the national level all these years. So we've had kind of uh, a lack of unifying leadership, at, at least as far as the American people can see. But at the same time, there's so much energy in the libertarian movement now and in so many different ways. And you can see that once people start on new projects, then even more people start on even more projects and all of these things. And obviously I'm in the free state of New Hampshire where you guys have been absolutely killing it for years now. And I got a, a great education on the way here from Boston uh, about all the successes and the proportion of seats you guys control in the state house and all of this kind of stuff. And it really shows how much can be done. And of course, you have the great Defend the Guard movement that's being pushed by... <laughs> and that's, you know, led by uh, veterans of the 21st century wars, the guys, Dan McKnight and all other guys at BringOurTroopsHome.us, and in conjunction with Young Americans for Liberty, which was Students for Ron Paul, which is our group that is you know, knocking the doors and doing the work to get this thing introduced. And it's being introduced by Republicans, which is so important for the narrative that anti-war belongs to all of us, and including people who lean right, and that it's not the province of some old day-glow hippie thing from the summer of love back before most of us were born. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about now. And so they're doing great work there. And then, of course, does anybody want to make a noise for the Mises Caucus here? Huh? <laughs> So a big, a big part of why I'm a libertarian dates back to the 1990s and Harry Brown's campaign for president in 1996. And then, of course, Ron Paul came back to Congress in 1997. He won election back to Congress that year, and so that's all I needed to know. I won't go into those details because you'll never get me to stop. <laughs> uh, but the thing is... What the Ron Paul revolution was, that's what the Harry Brown thing was in 96 and 2000, just bigger and better and, and bigger and better than we could have ever dreamed of, of getting. But it changed the entire world. I know a lot of you were a big part of that during that. And 
I think we have the potential to do something like that again. And I think a lot of the movement has stayed away from the Libertarian Party because we didn't really feel like there was anything we can do to make it say the things that we wanted it to say and do the things that we wanted it to do. And it was in the hands of people who were making some pretty bad decisions. Um, if I, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone or be negative, but I'm just saying, like, if I said to you, one thing's for sure, the Libertarian Party's been the vanguard of the anti-war movement for the last 20 years. <laughs> you would laugh and say, yeah, that's really not right. But the Libertarian Movement was. Antiwar.com has been here all along, <laughs> right? <laughs> and look, 99.9% .9 of everybody in the Libertarian Party is good on everything. I'm not picking on them, but the leadership could have said some things I'd have preferred they say. We'll just leave it at that. But here's the thing, is I think that you all agree that we see now that we have an opportunity to have the entire movement or, or massive proportions of the movement kind of all at once join the Libertarian Party and turn it into the kind of thing that we can be proud of. And you know, um, Tom Woods and Dave Smith joined the LP what, back two and a half, year, three years ago. And they asked me to join with them, and I said, well, I don't want to do that because we don't really have a plan, right? Like, I think if the three of us all kind of join at once, everybody's going to think something's going on. But there's nothing going on. What are we going to do? And Tom actually had great reasons why to join the party. If for nothing else, he said, out of respect for the people who've been out there pounding the pavement, collecting the signatures, keeping them on the ballot, and keeping the name alive this whole time, uh, was a very important reason to do it. But I held off, and, but I'm in the party now. And I think that uh, with the Mises Caucus leading, but not just the Mises Caucus, I think we have all different factions of the Libertarian movement joining the Libertarian Party and really excited to use it just the same way that our movement is using the Republican Party in some circumstances to really change the narrative and the political conversation in this country. The left and the right have blown it. Well, the liberals and the conservatives have blown it. And people are moving further to the socialist left and the nationalist right and, and, and hating each other more and more than ever before. And you can blame Mark Zuckerberg or whoever's the problem for making it this way. It's really the Clintons and the Bushes who've run the empire into the ground is what has happened. And, but so there's something that we all have in, in common in this country. And it's not Rothbard, it's Jefferson and our Declaration of Independence, which in its second paragraph invokes the natural rights of all mankind right there. That's what we all believe in, and that's what we all have in common. And if the libertarian movement really speaks up and gets our act together and we play our cards right, then I think we can really set the narrative of how to set America right, end the wars, end the crony, corrupt capitalism and bailouts, end the war on drugs in the police state, which is, of course, it, it's by far the number one cause of all the racial tensions in America is the police state. And you see them change everything except accountability for killer cops, which is the issue at hand. And so, and the list goes on, the boom and the bust cycle and inflationary money and guns, and you guys know the litany. But the thing is about it is most Americans are pretty good on most things. If they have good libertarian leadership, just like in the days we saw with Ron Paul, where he went from 30 miles an hour to 5,000, with just with that Giuliani moment and giving people the opportunity to see and hear what we have to say and know that that's right and that's something worth amplifying and to make this country less worse so that we can live in it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, guys. I got books for sale in the Mises Caucus tent. Don't let me get on a plane with books out of here. Thank you, guys.